This is Polyamory Weekly, tales from the front of responsible non-monogamy from a pansexual, kink-friendly point of view. A warning for our under-18 listeners, this is an adult-oriented podcast about really lascivious things like communication and honesty in relationships. If you're under 18 and looking for upfront advice and answers to questions about sex, please visit scarletteen.com. This is Polyamory Weekly, episode 544, for January 11th, 2018. Coming up on today's show, Sisterhood and Polyamory. That's coming up on today's show. Hello and happy 2018 to everybody. I am so excited to have this episode in the can and here to present to you because some of the things that our friend Iris Muscarella talked about are things that I have actually decided to implement this year because her message was so strong and powerful to me. And because of that, I'm actually going to skip the Polly in the News and the host chat section, and let's just go straight into our talk with Iris Muscarella about sisterhood and polyamory and why that's important. I am so excited to welcome back to the Polly Weekly Studios, Iris Muscarella. Welcome back. Hi, thank you for having me back. You know, we brought you back so soon because so many people just absolutely loved your last appearance. (laughs) For those who might have missed it, who just discovered podcasts in general or Polly Weekly in particular, can you introduce yourself to our audience? Yes. Hi, um, uh, my name is Iris Muscarella. Um, I am a self-identifying, multicultural, black, queer, feminist woman. I'm also a pansexual, sapiosexual, and I am a solo egalitarian polyamorous. Um, And I'm also a uh, burlesque performer. I'm an entrepreneur, a jazz singer, and a dance teacher. So I do a lot of different things. (laughs) So you don't just want to have that one sentence bio. You really have to be all the things. Yeah, yeah. I I, uh, I have a tendency. uh, I'm an overachiever. So, you know, I want to be all the things, apparently. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I've noticed a lot of poly people do tend to be overachievers. Hmm. wonder what the correlation is. Yeah. We'll just pile on that workload. We're fine. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. We we, we just want to do everything. Yeah. No, I invited you back because we wanted to talk a little bit more about one of the things that you uh, really – Um, advocate for, which is sisterhood and polyamory and really taking the time and effort to establish and reinforce woman-to-woman bonds. Bonding, not bondage, although that may be part of it. Hey, maybe, you know. (laughs) Yeah. Um, But before we get to that, um, you mentioned that you got some feedback directly on some of the things you said in your last episode. So let's talk about that. Yeah, um, I had some people message me and talk to me about uh, relationship anarchy, which, you know, last time I did admit that I didn't know a whole lot about and I was still trying to uh, kind of pin down a definition. And I had some people send me some really good uh, sources for relationship anarchy and understanding kind of what that is. And I got actually a a really good uh, definition. And I also got to read some stuff by uh, Andy Nordren, who is apparently the uh, person who coined the term relationship anarchy. So I'm still kind of looking into it, but I found a really good definition that I'd like to share. Oh, please do. They said relationships that are not bound by societal rules, no hierarchy with relationships outside of children, a focus on commitment to communication, consensual and intentional relationships, love and respect over entitlement, and customized commitments. So, you know, it's really interesting. And and Andy Nordring kind of goes on some more kind of stuff. He goes a little bit deeper into it. So I I would highly suggest if somebody's looking to understand maybe relationship anarchy, uh, maybe to look into some of the stuff that Andy Nordring is doing, because it it really was informative. It's a lot, though. It's it's a lot to read. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I suspect my reaction to – I think I'm just an old fogey. I'm just – you know, guys, you you folks know that I talk about this all the time, that sometimes I think I am just kind of getting to that age where I'm an old fogey because my response to it is interestingly what I think a lot of people's response to polyamory is, which is, well, that sounds nice in theory. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but – How is it actually practiced? I've seen a lot of RA relationships that people were kind of just 
assholes to each other. But then again, frankly, there are a lot of poly relationships where people are assholes and a lot of mono too. You know, mono yeah. relationships where people are assholes. Yeah. So, you know, maybe that's maybe that's not entirely fair. But but I really appreciate you're doing the research on that because I admit I hadn't done a lot of research on it. We don't get too many requests for RA. I mean a couple every now and then. So yeah. thank you for doing it. You're that. welcome, of course. I definitely want to educate myself and I don't really want to misrepresent anybody. So it was I wasn't really happy to receive the letters and really happy to receive the uh, the information to educate myself on it. Fantastic. So let's move on to talking about what we had originally talked about uh, bringing you back on to discuss, which is going a little bit deeper into these woman-to-woman relationships. Yeah, female identifying and, to female identifying. Right. I know, <laughs> we have to make it longer and more complicated yeah, of course. because we're poly. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> you know, we want to be inclusive. Yeah. And I actually like the word sisterhood. I just think that it rings a little vaguely of weird Mormon cultish stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so how would you describe healthy sisterhood in polyamory? For me, healthy sisterhood in polyamory is the intentional journey of seeking friendships, intimacy, support, and understanding with other polyamorous women. And that can include like, you know, friendships, partners, meta relationships, online associations. It's creating a support system of women who are, you know, open and educated in poly. And why is this so important? I think that a lot of the times that, you know, you look in media, you look in like just common things, women are always portrayed as competing with one another over the attention and affection of, you know, different love interests. And I think it's really important that we both disprove that theory as well as create bonds that are rich and protect us as poly women. Also, women can be in poly relationships with one another. They can bond as metamors, they can share partners, and they can support one another on an intimate emotional level without forcing a distinct a distinction between friends and partners based on you know sexual connections in the way that most monogamous paradigms enforce. You know, I have to share something with you. Yeah. <laughs> so, Lusty Guy has been out of the country on vacation this week. Yeah. So it's just been Elle and me together in the house. And you know, I only moved in two months ago. Yeah. So I'm I'm still adjusting to having other people in the house yeah. and not having it just be me and my cat and having <laughs> a little less privacy and a little more companionship. <laughs> And I wasn't really worried about it because Elle is super easy to get along with and she's absolutely fabulous. Yeah. But I didn't realize it's kind of been – it's been really wonderful. It's kind of yeah. been a lot more peaceful with that. I love you, Lusty Guy. I do. <laughs> But it's been really, really nice. It's been a little quieter. And she and I have had a lot of time to just be together quietly. Like last Friday night, we just sat – it's normally when I would have date night with Lusty Guy. And I was really tired by the time I got home. I usually don't get home until about 7 or 7.30. And I'm like, can we watch Firefly? I kind of just want to drink hot chocolate and watch Firefly. (laughs) Yeah. And it was absolutely delightful. Yeah. And it's like you can watch all your favorite chick flicks with your meta and, you know, like y'all could just have like great girl time. And we miss out on that girl time as we get older, you know, because then it becomes, it it changes things as you get older. As a, as you know, as a child, you're told to create those bonds and to have good friends and have sleepovers and, you know, have your good girlfriends. But as you get older, you're told to focus on your partner, told to focus on your family, told to focus on your career. And that, you know, basically, you know, other women are your competition. And so when you can get out of that, it's a great thing. You know, that's a good point because I long ago rejected the idea that women are competition. I say that and I'm sure there's still some sort of ingrained part of me that still see it that way. I'll I'll just, I'll, I'll own that bit. But you're absolutely right in that, you know, I am certainly prioritizing my job. I am, it's hard even to find time to make dates with Lusty Guy and then to find a little time for myself. and. It's not that, you know, I ever really saw L as competition, but, you know, it's just in terms of priorities, something's got to give. And some very often it is that metamor relationship that, you know, I just don't always make the effort to take the time to do things together, just her and I. But I do think that after, you know, having this fortuitous, you know, week together and having it be really wonderful and relaxing. And, you know, we went, we had brunch today and went out for pedicures and it was just absolutely lovely and wonderful. I love the way it feels. Yeah, I do too. I I love feminine energy. I love, I feel like with women, 
more often than not, we are the givers of energy, right? And so when you have more than one woman there, you know, in a healthy setting, you tend to give to each other, you tend to feed each other, and it becomes this really great circle of like just energy feeding, a feminine energy, you know, which is, you know, soft and nurturing. And, you know, I, I love it. We do. I didn't really realize how nourishing it was going to be because most of my time commitments are, you know, time commitments. There's, there's give and take. I'm not going to say everything I do is draining. That sounds yeah. awful. But it was it was more nourishing than I had anticipated, and I've I feel like I've always been bad at friendships with women. I've always it's always been much easier for me to make friends with men than with women, and I don't know if that's you know some sort of ingrained competition, or maybe I'm just shy, or you know maybe it's that women don't trust me because I've always been kind of thin, and um, and so maybe women are seeing something in me that I don't see in myself, and and reacting to that. You know, what do you say to women like that that? feel like we're just not great at making female friends. I mean, I think that we all, you know, we're all able to make friends. And I think that, you know, society has told us that it's harder to make friends with women, right? Because, you know, we're told that we're emotional, we're told that we're catty, we're told that we're competitive, you know, we're told all these like negative aspects about ourselves, but these are actually things that are taught to us, right? Once we start seeing each other as, I always put it as competition, I'm a competitive person, and so one of the yeah, me yeah too. so one of the things I had to rid myself of was my need to compete, my need to be the best. And you know, I don't think I've ever really been catty necessarily. I'm sure I've had some catty moments. I know that, but you know, I don't think I've ever really been catty. Uh, but I, you know, up until adulthood, I did make friends better with men than I did with women, or women I felt like had masculine personality qualities. And like, as I've gotten older, I kind of just realized that that's actually really not the case. When I really kind of just open myself up and try to find common ground with somebody, nine times out of 10, I can, you know, there's always going to be those people that you just don't click with and you just don't get along with. You know, I've had, as far as metas have gone, I've had 99% successful meta friendships, you know, and 1% where we just couldn't get along. It's going to happen. And I think you just, you don't get discouraged by it. You just try to kind of find common ground and you try to talk to people who are maybe interested in the same things that you're interested in. And sometimes being poly isn't enough, especially depending on where they are in their journey, because sometimes it's not you. Sometimes it's them and where they are in their journey. I'm a very feminine presenting girly girl female who's also super athletic and rough. But with the way that people look at me, they wouldn't see that. They would just see a girly girl and a pretty girl. And, you know, I've had people come to me later on and go, hey, you know what? I want to apologize because I made some assumptions about you based on what you look like and treated you in a certain way. But I've seen the way you interact with other people. I've seen the way that you present yourself. And, you know, I've seen that it's a real thing. And so I just want to apologize to you for that. Where we had this barrier before because they had this preconceived notion of me. If I just continue saying genuine and kind and, you know, good in my circle, eventually they would see that just really who was who I was. It wasn't an act, you know, it wasn't anything like that. Like, that's really who I was. And I try to be an ally to women, you know, like if I see something happening, I stand up and I say something. If I see a woman crying or something, I make sure she's okay. I try to be an ally to other women as much as I can, even if it puts me in a like somewhat uncomfortable position, because I feel like we're all we got. We're, we have to look out yeah. for each other because we're all we have. Yeah, absolutely. How do we do that, though? If we feel awkward or we feel like maybe other women see us a certain way and that's getting in the way, how do we go about forming these sisterhood type bonds. You know, I do things like host ladies only brunches and, you know, ask to go for pedicures. And I do reach out to my female friends as much as I, you know, feel like I can, but I still feel like I'm just not that great at it. And I see other people who do seem to manage to have these lifelong female friendships, which I've never been able to do. How do we form those bonds? I mean, I think there's a lot of different ways and it's depending on the nature of the relationship. For me, like, I know that I'm going into dating someone and they already have pre-existing partners. I'm very clear about the thing that I require a a mostly tabletop poly approach to my poly. And define tabletop poly? Tabletop poly is where we could all sit at the kitchen table and have a drink together and hang out and it's not a big deal. You know, no one's being put out. No one's, you know, irritated or anything like that. Where, you know, we can be all social with one another and not have to, I don't do, don't ask, don't tell. 
I don't really do hierarchies or anything where I can't, one, confirm that I'm being told the truth, that this is an open relationship, you know, that this is Mm -hmm. a poly relationship. And two, I don't like to do anything where I can't meet my meta only for the thing of, I know what I look like. And I know what people think about me if they just saw me. And I think that that can create a space for a lot of jealousy because they'll imagine that I'm this person that I'm not. You know, and I can imagine there is some person that they're not. Right off the bat, if I know I'm going into a dating situation, they have partners. I will obviously ask for permission first, but I like to message their partner and just be proactive and let them know, you know, hey, I recognize you. I recognize your relationship. I respect it. I want to introduce myself and put a face to a name. If you ever want to talk or anything along those lines, like I'm open to to talking to you. And if you don't, that's totally fine. I understand. I just wanted to introduce myself so that we are aware of one another. And typically that typically starts things off on a really good note because I am giving them the respect of recognizing and respecting their relationship. And so that typically does help a lot and it humanizes me as well. Also with my metas, I like to try to set up like a lunch or a dinner alone with them so that we can kind of develop a friendship and get to know each other on a one-on-one level. You know, I also, I do meta vacations where just me and my meta or metas go on vacation together and have a girls weekend together and bond together. That sounds so fun. I have friends who do that, who do like a girls weekend in Vegas or whatever. And I'm like, I've never had the kind of friends that do that sort of thing. I don't know. Is it me? How do you, how do you, how do you get the kind of friends and metas that are willing to go on vacation with you? Somebody's got to be the spearhead, right? Like somebody's got to be the organizer, you know, in every group there's a leader. So you have to figure out first who's the leader. Just kind of have a thing where like the leader spearheads it. Like, hey guys, I'd really like to do a girls weekend with my metas. What were we thinking would be fun for everybody? I want to go to the beach or I want to go to Vegas or I want to go do this or I want to go to that. All right, let's find the middle ground where everybody could be happy. And then let's plan. So let's talk about schedules now. What what do y'all have available? This is what I have available. Okay, we can all be available on this weekend. Let's all go down. Let's talk about prices. I'll price it out for everybody. Somebody has to spearhead it. And everybody has different things that they're good at. And so you give everybody a chance to do the thing that they're good at to add to the group dynamic so that everybody feels like they're contributing and they're a part of something. And it gives you time alone by yourselves to just bond and talk and have conversation and like, you know, just hang out with each other and do something fun and have an adventure and and build that bond that way. It's basically project management is what you're saying. (laughs) It basically is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it really is. I'm typically the spearhead in most of my meta relationships. I'm shocked. I'm the planner. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. You know, who who knew? Uh, I'm the planner most of the time. But even if we we haven't been able to, maybe like if we all wanted to go to an event, like I do burlesque, so I will invite everybody to my burlesque shows. And some of them are really fun. They're really themed and stuff like that. So like we've done stuff where all the girls will come to my house. And we'll all do each other's makeup and hair, you know, whoever is better at whatever thing. We'll all get dressed together. Like we go to costume shops and rent costumes together. And it becomes a a really good friends relationship on top of it. So that even when the relationship ends, they're still my friend. I had a a breakup recently. It it didn't go so well. We said some choice words to one another. We did it via text message. Oh, dear. She <laughs> broke up through text. Oh, that's terrible. I, Iris, I, come I, on. I, did, I didn't spearhead it. Someone else did. So they broke up with me via text, oh, dear. which obviously led to some very choice words being said, you know. Okay. Folks, do not break up through text. If you've been together yeah, for more- Yeah, it's the worst. If you've been together for more than a week, don't break up over text or IM or, 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 yeah. or phone call unless you're, you know, more than a thousand miles apart. Come on. Come yeah. on. You spend two, it you spend person, two years people. with somebody, do it in person. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you know, we had some choice words because I was like, two years and I get a text message. Yeah. Okay, that's cool. You know, I was really worried about, you know, the, my next immediate thought after, you know, chewing this person out and saying what I had to say yeah. was, oh, my God, I hope I don't lose my meta over this. Yeah. And so I messaged her immediately and I was just like, hey, look. We had some choice words between us and we said some things and I know that that's your partner and that's where your loyalty lies. And if you need to take a break from our friendship, I understand that, but I want to let you know that I love you very much and I very much appreciate our friendship. And uh, I fully expected to get a message back. Like I might need to take some space, you know, so on and so forth. But the Uh next message was, are you, are you okay? Aww. 
And uh, oh. it just, you know, I cried a whole lot, you know, because I was like, thank you so much. You know, she's like, I just want you to know I love you. I'm here. I'm holding space for you. Oh, it's how fine. It's giving you know? me goosebumps. How wonderful to hear. <laughs> it's been, uh, you know, really great that I could keep that friendship and, and, you know, keep that relationship, even though my, you know, our, our shared partner, we no longer share them and it didn't end well. But our friendship was so strong that I had somebody there supporting oh, me wonderful. who knew the situation. And I'd like to circle back to something we were talking about just a few minutes ago about how it is that you make this time and how it is that you, you get the girls together, basically, get the ladies, girls, women, whatever, the female yeah. identified together. And you did mention basically a project management philosophy. Uh, yeah. I do want to point out, though, that you don't necessarily have to be the one spearheading that. If one is introverted or not going to be the one organizing the vacation, that you can still come up to the person who is the project manager or the cruise director or the social coordinator and say, I would really love a girls weekend away. I can't plan it, but I would like this. Can someone do that? Yes, of course. Of course. I think that the great thing about Polly is that you can play on everybody's strengths. Hey, I'm not the spearheader. I'm, I'm introverted. So I'm going to go to the person I know can do it, you know, who can get that job done and go, hey, look, I, I really want to do something. This is kind of what I was thinking. Could you run it by everybody and, you know, do that? Like uh, in, in one of my relationships, my girlfriend is the networker. Okay. She mm -hmm. is phenomenal at networking and keeping up with people and keeping up with their stories and their names and where we met them. When we go to social events, it's basically like the Devil Wears Prada where she has her assistants telling her who people are. That is the dynamic of our social relationship. I'm like, who is that? She's like, that's such and such. We met them at this thing and did it. I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got it. You know? So oh, I still need that person. Can I have that person? I need that person. Yeah. I you forget know. everyone. It is embarrassing. Yeah. I do the same thing. And so we play off each other's strengths. So I think with, with meta relationships and just female poly friendships and so on and so forth, I think you should play off people's strengths, what they're good at. A really good example of that is that I do uh, poly girl sleepovers here in Dallas. What I'll do is everybody brings a skill. Yes, I'm having it at my house. I plan the date and I'll cook some food, but other people will bring food. Other people will bring drinks. Some of the girls are bartenders. They'll be making drinks for us all night. Some girls are, are nesters. And so they'll come over and like set up my whole house as one big pallet. You know, some girls are really good braiders and so they'll braid the girl's hair and, you know, we have girls who do body paint and they'll come over and body paint us and we just get to bond and play games and talk and have conversations and hold each other and have advice and have girl, like girl on girl cuddle sessions with it being completely non-sexual and we just get to really thrive on this female energy and everybody has a part in it. Everybody is contributing. I think that's a big deal in creating these friendships is that everybody is able to put something in. They're able to contribute. That sounds delightful. Iris, I can't believe our time is almost up. It's always a pleasure talking with you. Same, same. Is there anything else you want to say before we let you go? Yeah, I do kind of want to talk about also why I think another another reason I think it's really important to have that sisterhood. It's also to protect our fellow poly sisters. You know, I feel like whatever you do, like poly magnifies anything that you do within a relationship. So I think when you have abusive poly relationships, if mm -hmm. one partner can come to another partner and go, hey, does this person do this to you in your relationship? Because they do it to me and it really hurts my feelings. And then if you can match, then you can sit there and talk to your partner like, hey, you do this to both of us and it really hurts us. And if you're unaware of it, let's talk about how to change it to better our relationship. Also, you know, in situations where, you know, someone may play their partners against each other. If they have open communication oh. with each other, they can just come to each other and go, hey, such and such told me this, you know, and I just wanted to run this by you if this is, if this is true and do you want to talk about it? And then they can't be played against each other. And I think the other thing is it's an invaluable network of information, mm. poly sisterhood. All these poly communities, they're pretty tight knit and they're pretty like, you know, quote unquote incestuous, as I, I like to call it, uh, for lack of a better mm. word. If I'm going to date somebody new that I don't know what I'll do is I'll, I'll send the note out in my like poly girl groups and go, hey, does anybody know this person? If they have information, they'll go, oh, yeah, yeah, I know that person. They were dating such and such. They're a great person. Or recently I was going to go on a date with somebody and 
I found out that he actually had a history of violence and physical abuse and sexual assault. Oh, my. And uh, so because of that, obviously, I did not go on a date or anything like that. That could have saved me. Like, anything could have happened to me. And I think that really saved me. Yeah. Yeah. I think health-wise, too. There was a guy here who had kn- knew he had an STI and was passing it around to a lot of women. He basically played them against each other. And had they had open communication with one another, as they were finding out, if one found out, they would all found out. But instead, they had to go through the grapevine and find out here and there. I think it's one of those things that we can protect each other through sisterhood. We can protect each other through these strong female bonds. We can keep the men accountable because I, honestly, I feel like women are very responsible for a lot of the dynamics in poly relationships. You know, we are the, the main people who handle all these things. And, uh, you know, I don't think we should always have to take on the emotional toil of it. But if we stick together, I think that we can all be happier in our poly relationships. I cannot say it any better than that. So that's a great note to end on. (laughs) Iris, where can people find you? Yes, you can find me on Facebook under Iris Lemore. And that's I-R-I-S-L-E apostrophe M-O-U-R. I'm also on Instagram under the same name. So uh, feel free to message and, you know, ask questions. A lot of people have sent me a lot of messages and uh, I really appreciate them. Fantastic. Thanks again for joining us. It's always a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. It's always a pleasure to be here. And thanks again to Iris for taking the time to meet with us. Always a pleasure to talk with her and so excited for the next time we bring her back. Hi, Cunning Minx and Leslie Guy. This is Maria. I'm from Pennsylvania. I've been listening to your show for the last few months and it's been a breath of fresh air. I've been realizing that I've been polyamory uh, for the majority of my life. And when I found your podcast, I was so moved by how vulnerable you both are, how real, how authentic. Um, Ever since I um, started researching polyamory and listening to your podcast and also reading other articles, in general, I just can't believe the authenticity and the kindness um, that you both have for each other and Thank you for that. I think it really gives me hope that this polyamorous thing is something that's really beautiful and can be done. Um, Thank you, thank you, thank you. I have a phone to pick, uh, too. So my phone to pick is this. I really wish you guys would use your regular names because I feel like you are standing up for polyamory and you're asking society to really appreciate us as real people, polyamorous as real people, not like fictional um, comic characters or things like that. And I would just love to know your real name because it's you standing up for being who you are, saying that there's nothing shameful, that you don't have to hide anything about being polyamorous. Um, yeah, I feel like that would be really refreshing and something that it just goes along with your show and with both of your energies and what you stand for, which is authenticity, no hiding, coming out, being real. So that's my request. L- would love to know your names. Um, and I would just even be curious, too, of why you don't use your names. Like, what is that about? Um, because I, I feel like sometimes, too, that it's easy to um, to for people to sexualize polyamorous to believe that they're only about sex, right? It's something that you say. It's not about the sex. And when you use, like, lusty guy and cutting things, it's just, I don't know. I feel like it's kind of a way of, of limiting yourself, too, a bit. But um, I don't know. I could be wrong. This is kind of how I'm feeling right now. Well, thanks, Maria, for taking the time to call in. And that is a very good question. It is true that most other sex-positive educators in the space do use their real names. I can think of one or two that don't. And most likely for the same reason that I don't is because this is not my full-time job. This is my volunteer activity. The donations that come in help us to cover the cost of bandwidth and some of our recording equipment and help us cover some of our food and expenses when we travel to speak at other shows. But uh, by no means is this a full-time occupation for me, which means that I have to have a quote-unquote real job. And while the company I work for is notoriously open-minded, It has not, I have not always worked for this company. I have worked for startups in the past. And 
In the work world, it is not uncommon for someone to Google the person that you're about to have a meeting with. And if I were to use my real name, because... I don't have that much of a presence under online under my vanilla name, but I definitely do under my Minx name. That means that naked pictures of Minx being tied up and hung from the rafters and all kinds of super sexy fun might come up when somebody was Googling my vanilla name if I were to use that. And that's just not really appropriate for, you know, most tech marketing meetings. Now, that being said, I'm getting closer and closer to just saying, fuck it all. If they want to fire me, they fire me, and just using my real name. Because I agree, it's a bit more authentic. Again, there are only one or two other people that still need their day jobs, and so therefore do not use their real names. But there is that element of hiding behind a mask, and that is, you know, that's a concern when we're talking about being honest and transparent and authentic. Right now, it's basically so that I can keep bringing you the show, because without a full-time job with healthcare and vision and dental and all the other things I need to be happy and healthy minx, the day job has to be the first priority for me. But that being said, you can believe that the second that I retire and no longer need that income... Oh yeah, I am going to merge the Facebook accounts and the Twitter accounts and just have everything be out in the open. Our next bit of feedback was from Alan, who was writing in response to a question a few episodes ago about the Christian response to polyamory, and he actually wrote in to suggest a couple of different churches that are poly-friendly. And it's kind of long, so I'm going to summarize. The first church he recommended was the Metro Community Church. He writes, with over 220 congregations in 37 countries, they're present in many of the large U.S. metroplexes. In a recent statement intended to counter the evangelical fundamentalist Nashville statement on sexuality and marriage, the MCC endorsed polyamorous relationships as being as valid as monogamy. The second church he recommends is the Unitarian Universalist, or UU Church, already a popular choice among a number of poly folks, as you may know. There is even, he says, a Unitarian Universalists for Polyamory Awareness Group within the church. That's pretty cool. I've been to UU churches, and um, they were quite kind and welcoming and actually, you know, pretty enjoyable as far as worship services. The third one he recommends is the Christian New Thought churches, such as Unity and Religious Science. These churches reinterpret traditional Christian theology from an esoteric and metaphysical perspective, presenting what many would consider to be a deeper, kinder, and less judgmental understanding of the Christian message. Well, thanks very much for that feedback, Alan. And with that... It's time for your Happy Poly Moment of the Week, brought to you by Fubbly Polyamorists Everywhere. Our Happy Poly Moment this week is from Anne, who said... My boyfriend and his other girlfriend and I have slowly developed into a very happy poly triad. Although we all live in our own separate apartments, the three of us begin spending time together about once a month to attend a sex-positive event. Other folks at the event began asking us about our relationship as we're a bit of a curiosity. It's hard to explain, but it all feels so natural. Yes, triads are still a novelty in the poly community, but we're proof that it can work. We just spent our first wonderful, loving Christmas together. Here's to 2018 from our happy family. Aw, thanks, Anne. And thanks to Teresa for sending in a $100 three-digit donation this week. Woo! Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to us. And that wraps it up for today's show. Thanks to Iris for joining us and sharing her ideas with us yet again. And we are a free resource. We have helped hundreds of thousands of people navigate their introduction to polyamory. Your donations and your comments and questions keep this podcast awesome. If you do have questions, 802-505-POLY, call in, ask your question. We may answer it on the show. Or you can email polyweekly at gmail.com. Or if you'd like to book us to speak at your events or maybe to teach a class remotely through Skype or some other tool, lustyguy at polyweekly.com is our business manager. 
And you can, of course, find us on Twitter at PolyWeekly, on Facebook.com forward slash PolyWeekly, and of course, our website, blog, where we have all our courses and FAQs and book recommendations are at PolyWeekly.com. Thanks for listening, and remember, it's not all about the sex. (laughs) <laughs>